Labor unions have been losing membership for several years. Will they survive? We'll examine this question on today's program along with issues concerning the North Atlantic Treaty Organization. Also, we'll learn how early to expose children to art. Dean Neil Palumba, Ball State College of Business, has done extensive research on the diminishing interest and membership of labor unions. And the question is, will they survive? Dean Palumba, will they? Well, I, it's obviously a very complex area and a very, um, uh, very difficult to predict precisely. My short answer would be yes, they will survive. The longer answer is only if they continue to show strong signs of changing with the times. Labor unions in the United States, from an extremely low percentage of the labor force, uh, they have gone up to uh, uh, something like one-third of the labor force was unionized in, at the height of the union movement in this country. They are now down to less than 20 percent, and, and the trend line is, is down. And so in one prediction, you could look at it and say it's very clear that unions are on the way out there, history. The, uh, on the other hand, I would argue that if you look very carefully at their past history and the way they've been able to change with the times, I think we have a small but strong evidence that some of the major unions are willing and ready to be flexible. If they are, the union movement will survive, will remain in the United States. I would predict that as much as 20 or 30 percent of the labor force could eventually again be unionized. If they do not become flexible, if they don't change with the economic times, if they don't go along with the greater emphasis on competition, then indeed unions will become simply a historical phenomena. Of course, the, the great growth and strength of the unions around the turn of the century mm -hmm. was caused by the exploitation of the worker on the part of industry, manufacturers, and companies. If we see a weakening of the unions to a point mm -hmm. where they lose a great deal of their effectiveness and strength, will we see a period of exploitation of the worker as formerly before the strength of the okay. union. That's very interesting. I would argue, uh, to answer that question, let me back up just for a second. I would argue that the biggest impact U.S. unions have had, this is U.S. unions, not unions in other countries, the biggest impact I think they've had has not been in the economics arena. Their impact there has not been zero. But their biggest impact has been in this uh, jurisprudence or the legal protections at the, at the work site, not laws at home or uh, affecting us as citizens. But the, the many, many American workers, uh, we would argue, because of the union movement, now have much more protection at their work site as, as against uh, uh, arbitrary discharge, um, uh, forced overtime, arbitrary treatment. The interesting thing is that if you look at recent court decisions, that uh, the courts themselves, the legal system in the United States in the last few years, have begun to put restrictions on what is called the employment at will principle of, of uh, U.S. industry, and that is uh, even in the absence of unions, our courts are beginning to show, in some states, are beginning to show a great concern that even a non-union worker who has worked for a number of years and, and has shown him or herself to be a good worker, they can be discharged for economic reason, or they can be discharged for thievery or something of that nature, but they can't be discharged at will. There has to be a system. So the answer to your question is that if, if unions don't get flexible and don't survive, I don't think we'll return to the old days of quote, quote, exploitation because I think the legal system that is in place now will not permit that. So that uh, the biggest impact I'd say unions have had, positive impact they've had in this country is on the legal protection of workers. With or without unions, those protections will remain. I still am optimistic though that when I say optimistic, I still would predict that unions will survive, but only if they become far more um, uh, flexible as to uh, uh, the competition. But again, uh, no, I don't, I would not expect, in the absence of unions, we're not going to go back to the 30s or before because the, I don't think our court systems would permit that. We can take uh, two good examples 
two very powerful unions, the UAW mm -hmm. and the Teamsters Union, mm -hmm. who have diminished in strength and power, mm -hmm. who at one time, you might say, even influenced national policy to some extent. Correct. Yeah, I, I would argue that uh, the most powerful unions in this country, and there are exceptions, okay, and there are isolated examples, but the most powerful unions from a na nationwide point of view have been the unions in what we would call protected industries. Industries protected by government regulation, transportation, trucking, airlines, or industries that for a, a number of years, not recently, but in the past, were protected by their very technology from competition. There was a time, for example, when U.S. Steel, uh, when the, not, not the company U.S. Steel, but when the U.S. Steel industry and the United States auto industry, through its technology, superior technology, dominated the world. It was not a monopoly, but, it, but its technology was so superior for a period of years that there was no real competition. Uh, I'm exaggerating somewhat, but not a great deal. And of course, in transportation, there was no competition for many years because the government, for various reasons, regulated that industry and said there would be no competition. It's interesting that the strongest unions, by size and by dollars, by wages, have occurred in this country almost always in these non-competitive industries. Now, what has happened recently, the union movement is under uh, uh, tremendous pressure to change because our economy is under pressure to change. The in steel industry in the United States is no longer in a protected, its technology is good, but the world technology is such that it's a highly competitive industry. Auto industry, U.S. auto industry at one time could almost ignore foreign competition. We all know that that ended several years ago. Uh, transportation, well, there we're not talking about f too much foreign competition as we're talking about deregulations. So I would argue that this, the, from an economic point of view, the strongest unions have always been unions in these protected industries, protected by technology, protected by government uh, regulation. With the ending of that government regulation, with deregulation, and with worldwide competition in auto, steel, plastics, electronics, you name it, we now find that the, our U.S. industries must get much more competitive, and the union movement is either have to go, go along with that and be helpful or be left behind. Very briefly, let me say that I see some signs, and maybe I'm just too much of an optimist, but I see some positive signs in, for example, the Saturn project, GM. The auto, UAW has said, has negotiated a brand new contract for just Saturn, and they went out of their way to say that this doesn't affect any other uh, production line. But you and I know that if it works, and if the Saturn project is a success, and if it's partly a success because of the flexible wages and the new work rules, how can, it, how can the UAW and General Motors not agree to these changes in their other production Is it lines? drastically different than other contracts? Oh, yes. Drastic. I, I'm not, I have not seen all the details myself, but it is far more flexible wages. It is um, far more flexible work rules. It is a kind, the, the UAW has agreed to a, uh, for just the Saturn project to a set of, um, uh, of flexibility, to a, to a level of flexibility that we have never had before. One final question, and in summation, very briefly, could you tell me if the diminishing strength and influence of the unions is occurring at such a rapid rate, is this a good thing for the country, our economy and the welfare of the worker? My short answer would be absolutely. And the reason being is that it's going to force all of us, companies and workers, the unions, to realize that we're in a competitive world. We're going to have to get far more flexible, be more competitive. I'm optimistic that the union movement and U.S. industry will become more competitive and will s survive very nicely. Good. Thank you very much, sir. Neil Palumba, Dean of the Ball State University College of Business. Commander Hugh Bone Pike, British Navy, and Commander Philippe Monu, Belgian Navy, recently talked with Ball State students about the purpose, readiness, and direction of the North Atlantic Treaty Organization. They shared those views with us. American forces were moved closer to Libya recently um, by President Reagan. Could a situation such as this develop into one that would involve NATO forces? It's unlikely. It's unlikely that it would, it would involve NATO forces from a military point of view, but of course all these things are discussed by the NATO um, alliance in the ministerial sessions. So we would first of all listen to what uh, a country like the United States was doing in that area. And then we would look very carefully 
at how this would affect NATO operations specifically designed to provide the sort of deterrence which is NATO's primary mission. So that from the point of view of perhaps a drawdown of forces, the American action uh, off Libya does have a peripheral effect on us, perhaps. But from a military standpoint, I don't think, uh, I don't foresee any direct involvement uh, by other NATO countries within the NATO umbrella. Of course, I think it's important to realize that uh, many other countries in Europe have, if you like, bilateral relationships with Libya, which need to be adjusted, perhaps, or looked at, certainly adjusted, maybe. And therefore, other countries within the NATO alliance will have feelings towards uh, Libya and may take some sort of action in conjunction with the Americans, either on a unilateral basis or maybe on a bilateral basis. Premier Gorbachev recently made a proposal to uh, reduce missiles in Europe and uh, made several proposals which President Reagan said he would study very carefully. Has there been a NATO reaction to those recommendations? Well, the NATO reaction, again, tends to take place in the political forum of NATO over in Brussels. And generally, of course, we would all, as an alliance, welcome any proposal which actually lowered the danger of nuclear war. And if this can be achieved by doing away with nuclear weapons, then, of course, this would be a welcome proposal. But, of course, what we in NATO are very aware of is that there were really two reasons why we have nuclear weapons. One is that, the, is that they're there, which is a major problem. We don't uh, see a way out of it. But the second thing, of course, is that in the past, the Warsaw Pact has enjoyed a very large superiority in conventional forces. And by deploying nuclear forces in Europe, we were able to produce within this uh, so-called triad of forces an effective deterrence against the Russians. Now, it remains to be seen, and it's early days at the moment uh, to say anything about it, but it remains to be seen how we could still provide a credible deterrence if we lost this uh, nuclear leg of the triad of forces. I'm sure we can do, and I'm sure that we'll look into this uh, in, 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 in great uh, detail to the extent that it deserves. I think, of course, uh, one should always say that the Russians have made a number of offers in uh, the nuclear field over the last um, 10 years or so. And it has been shown that they have not been entirely philanthropic in their aims. And I think, therefore, that uh, in welcoming at first this proposal by Mr. Gorbachev, one should be aware that uh, there may be altruistic uh, motives for it. There may well be purely personal motives for doing this. And I think this is what's going to be the subject of the debate leading up to the next uh, summit meeting. And I'm sure that all the NATO countries will be part of this debate. We read frequently reports from Jane's fighting ships and uh, reports on the advances being made in uh, uh, naval armament on the part of the Russians, the number of submarines, the number of warships, and so forth. Uh, NATO forces uh, keeping uh, pace with the Russians, uh, and do you consider our forces in as good a condition as the Russian forces? Well, of course, as far as numbers are concerned, we have suffered a very major decline in our naval forces uh, when compared with the Russians. I think it's true to say that when the alliance was formed in 1949, we outnumbered the Soviet Navy in uh, surface warships by something like three to one. At the time of the Cuban Missile Crisis, it went down to about two to one. And now we're approaching uh, parity. And the trend is certainly disturbing. I think another thing that's disturbing us a lot, of course, is that in the past, the qualitative gap between uh, Western navies and the Warsaw Pact navies was very considerable. That uh, we tended to relax behind the knowledge that uh, although the Soviets tended to have more airplanes in Europe, for example, more tanks in Europe, ours tended to be better, and we were quite happy with this. What we're seeing now, of course, is a very rapid increase uh, in the technical levels in the Soviet Union, the um, development of aircraft, for example, submarines, uh, missile systems, and so on. And this is causing us um, a considerable uh, degree of discomfort. I think also on the maritime field, we're seeing another change which concerns us. 
and that is the metamorphosis of the Soviet Navy from what was uh, originally a force designed to protect the homeland and had a very, if you like, uh, coastal, it was based on a sort of local coastal performance. It's now been changed, changed or is changing into a force that can operate deep into the Atlantic and indeed has done so and does so on many occasions. They deploy far further than they used to do. We've seen deployments, for example, down to Cuba. And this, again, is, a, is something which must clearly concern us. Commander Menu, uh, getting back once again to private confrontations between uh, countries that do not involve uh, NATO partners. Mm -hmm. In the situation with the American ships off Libya, uh, the Russians were reported to have been grouping their ships off the coast to inform the Libyans about American maneuvers and so forth. Uh, could a uh, confrontation between Amer American and Russian ships activate a, a NATO reaction? Well, that depends really on how the Americans perceive the confrontation, uh, how they perceive the threat to them. Uh, I would think in the Libyan situation it was not, because the American ships are there by order of their president. And uh, the confrontation that is likely to be is is, is not involving really the whole of NATO. It, it is not perceived as an attack on, on NATO, but it is a result of an, of an action of the two major powers. And the superpowers go to great effort to avoid confrontation, do they not? Well, the recent meeting, of course, between uh, President Reagan and uh, Mr. Gorbachev uh, is not likely to lead to uh, maritime confrontations. That's unlikely. Is the NATO alliance as strong as the Warsaw Alliance, which was activated to counter the NATO alliance? Well, we feel that the NATO alliance is much stronger uh, because it is an alliance of uh, independent sovereign nations, uh, each of which has its own contribution to that alliance. Uh, the Warsaw Pact is an alliance which is consisting of one superpower, and a lot of smaller nations who only have to say yes. Uh, we feel that uh, being a democratic alliance, we have that much more power behind us because we know the peoples of the nations are behind us. Are the problems that arose uh, with the confrontation between the Greeks and the Turks, both NATO members, uh, uh, having diminished somewhat, uh, are those problems being resolved within NATO? The problems of confrontations between member nations of NATO is, is something that is not really a subject of NATO discussions. What uh, NATO does is try to mediate in these uh, problems. And there are not only the military confrontation or semi-military confrontation between Greece and Turkey, there are other uh, economic confrontations or uh, uh, scientific uh, uh, confrontations between several nations, but these are discussed in the between the bodies, and uh, there are mediators that try to solve this. It is not a, really a NATO issue that would cause NATO to take up sides of, for one of the two. Do you think these military alliances, such as the NATO alliance, are something we're going to have to live with for several generations? I fear so. That's an 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 unless the Soviet Union gives up its aim of world domination through communism, we will have to live with NATO for a long period of time. Commander Hugh Bone Pike of the British Navy and Commander Philippe Monu of the Belgian Navy talking with us about NATO issues. Dr. Pauline Ahmad, Ball State Professor of Art, believes that children should be exposed to art at an early age. She talks with us about how to help children look at artwork and why it's important to teach them about art when they're young. How young should we start? You can start them as young as you like looking at artwork. The earlier that they are um, exposed to art, the more visually aware they become uh, when working just in the regular community and with jobs in the future. What types of art would you expose them to? Well, um, just having artworks around the house, you can take them to museums, take them to galleries, uh, give them art lessons actually in the, either in the preschool or even actually in the home. So. 
As a professor of art at Ball State University, you conduct classes for children and also for students who are going to teach art. Is that correct? That's correct, yes. The uh, art classes, actually, I don't really conduct them myself. What I'm doing is conducting the teachers who are going to be teaching the children in the art class programs. Mm -hmm. So when I first came here to Ball State, uh, the program that I took over was really just for the preschool and for kindergarten students. And I have developed the program into um, encompassing the ages of five years through 15 years. So the students that I teach during the regular week time, during their class time, I actually go into the uh, classrooms on Wednesday afternoons or Saturday mornings and teach these varied age groups. Ah, so. let's take a look at one of your class situations. Mm -hmm. uh, this is where the, stu the parents are actually coming in with the children and registering for the art classes. They are able to uh, look at a variety of classes available to them and then select from those classes for their child. Do the parents stay for the classes? They're able to if they wish, but generally they, they choose to leave. Yeah. <laughs> This is just one of the bulletin boards that the students made to help advertise their particular class. They were very interested in having a large group of students to learn about pop sculpture. Now that's very colorful and certainly would attract a, a young right. person. Wouldn't they it? were children ranging from about eight years and above that took this class, yeah. This was uh, a class that when I went in to evaluate the student, I thought there was utter chaos until I actually, actually sat down and started to observe what the student was doing in, in the teaching process. And she was trying to develop the student's awareness at orga organization, both the organization of them as a group and visual organization. Now, it, it would appear to be the, uh, an age difference between these students, or are they all of the same age? No, they are not all the same age. Um, this is, is an atypical situation that the students, my students are in, and they will frequently only be specified the youngest age that they can take the students. So this presents words, problems in teaching um, uh, if you have... No, not really. Oh. Um, you can put a variety of students together of different ages. They may very well have the same artistic ability. It's very much like a, an atypical situation where the cognitive ability doesn't always go along with the age uh, level. But how about the level of instruction? The level instruction of instruction, the, the student teacher has to adapt sometimes because the vocabulary of the younger student may not be uh, equal to that of an older student, but generally they can understand the same type of but concepts. But the older student doesn't sacrifice because no. of the younger? No. Very interesting. Uh, this is one of the student teachers assisting uh, individually the, the children. And again, we have a group of children working. Um, these are a similar group uh, working on sculptures also. Are they preschoolers? No. Um, we get very few preschoolers. We do get some kindergarten students. Mm -hmm. Are these kindergarten or first graders? Uh, Offhand, I can't recall. Mm -hmm. But pretty young. <laughs> yes. <laughs> and yes. very intense, I might add. Oh, yes. They sit there for, a, or not sit necessarily, but they have a two hour class period, which is quite an intense uh, two hours for them. They're not really used at this day, age to actually working for two hours on the same topic. So it's quite a feat both for the child and this for the teacher. This is one of the student teachers. Right. She seems very intent and so does she the student. She is and we even make them come in with broken arms. <laughs> <laughs> this is also another teacher working with a student. You have a wide range of uh, art classes, don't you? Yes. And, and we, uh, media? Right. We, we try to develop the ages as I say, I developed it from a young age to an older age. This um, coming quarter, we're hoping to even offer it to high school students. Now, this student on the left look appears to be, is that a student on the left? Yes. No, well, that's one of the children on the left. On the left. That's, yes. uh, yeah, I mean, that's what I meant, one of yes. the in the classes. And the instructor is in the center with another, and there no, again. No, that's uh, another child taking the class. Ah. The instructor is not in that picture. I see. They, these two are older and the, one, the third one looks younger. There again you have the age difference. They seem quite intent on what they're doing. Very much so. They really do develop an interest and what we try to do is to expose them to things that they would not normally be exposed to in the regular classroom, regular school. It is, is it always a hands-on, a, a do something sort of instruction? No. Um, we try to follow the standardized art curricula which is meaning that they should always cover some studio activity.
but also cover um, some art history, some art criticism, and also art in relation to their everyday life, so that it does make them more aesthetically aware, more visually aware for future. This is some of the work from the final exhibit that we had, or have every single quarter that we offer the classes. And these were some sculptures done by some rather small children. They <laughs> appear to be well done. They are very well done. The mere fact that they'll stand up uh, shows that they've done something right. And uh, we offered them different colors of the modeling clay and really came out with some nice things. Oh, I like this. This was um, an additional project that some students, uh, we didn't actually offer the art classes at Ball State that time. We offered them through the Y. And this is the mural that the YMCA has ended up with. <laughs> What was the age of the student that completed that mural? Uh, there they, was more than one. There was more than one student. There was a group, and they ranged from about 10 years to 13 or 14 years. Hmm. So, this is one of the uh, student teachers who is developing the projects, etc., for the final exhibit. And part of the exhibit, uh, they decorate everything in sight, uh, <laughs> even up as far as the ceiling, which in the art building is no mean feat. <laughs> The exhibit is always held mm. at the art building? Yes. Mm. Yes, this is part of the exhibit as well. All the parents and they uh, suggested that they bring friends and grandmas and grandpas and lots of the art professors come in and see it as well, Good. which is very but, nice. And I'm sure you can see uh, some very uh, talent early on. In the, yes, uh, and one of the, another nice thing is that we have students coming back every quarter from, from uh, the community. This is also part of the art exhibit. One group of the children decided they were going to put on a little performance for their uh, actual art projects and they've made masks and um, displays such as this, yes. This is part of a dragon that uh, was brought in and they had uh, old kings and queens and so forth. It was really quite interesting. <laughs> How can parents encourage their children to appreciate and enjoy art? by taking them to museums, by exposing them to actual artworks, and also encouraging them in their own art pursuits, in their visual art pursuits. Um, just by the mere fact of exposure, I think, allows students to appreciate. And uh, it's a little like um, always playing music in the house. If you always have classical music on right from an early age, that there's a good chance that student or children will grow up and appreciate classical music. And it's very much like that with visual art as well. Are your classes at Ball State open to the public if someone had a youngster they wanted to? You mean for the, class? the Saturday and the Wednesday program? Uh, yes. Oh, yes, very definitely. We um, advertise in the local newspapers and radios and various other ways of um, encouraging parents to bring their children along. You want as many as possible? Oh, yes. Uh -huh. And you have <laughs> yes. classes starting when? We have start classes starting again on March 22nd. And the best way of finding out about them, we always offer them in the fall and the spring of every year. And I seem to be the person that's always organizing them, so I'm a good person to contact. Or Fine. just our regular art office as well. At the Ball State mm -hmm. the University State. Art Department. That's correct. Thank you very much. Thank you. Dr. Pauline Ahmad, Ball State Professor of Art, talking about children being exposed to art at an early age. Thank you for joining us.